All right, y'all thought that I might be fibbing. This is proof right now. The Letterman Podcast. We have one sponsor, one sponsor only, but it is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Thank you very much for sponsoring our show, Rupert. It's my honor, Mike. La 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 Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. I am excited to be here, excited to present these uh, productions that we have that are in awe of the greatest body of broadcasting work in history, that of David Letterman and company. And it's really fun watching this world kind of expand and grow. Uh, we have been talking about the idea of getting some of these former staffers together and doing mashup episodes where uh, perhaps they and their uh, nostalgia or memories of working together might spark insight that those of us who really enjoy this world that was created uh, can en can enjoy, can uh, can also take part in uh, by being flies on the wall. Today is the first episode of that. Now, I'm going to tell you, there are moments of this episode that are a little bit chaotic, but they are worth it because we have Gerard Mulligan and Jeff Martin on this episode uh, of the Letterman Podcast. I'm so excited about this. Um, it was amazing for, for myself and for Don Giller, by the way, who is uh, basically in this entire episode. Um, he's all over it. Um, to to watch these two uh titans of writing titans of comedy um and 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 just uh folks who authored many of the subconscious pathways that live in my brain today uh we wouldn't know plant boy if it wasn't for these two guys <laughs> just plant boy so many things it's a great episode uh but it is a little chaotic like you know, there's a bit of a learning curve to having multiple people on 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 Zoom. But shout outs to folks who can do this every single week, where they have 15 people on, and 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 can make a show out of that. Uh, so it's a little bit chaotic, but it is fun. Like it is, it is a fun episode, for sure. And certainly, if this is the first mashup that we do, holy smokes, are they going to be cool moving forward? Now. Um, I'm going to finish the intro here in just a second. Uh, I just want to, I think we shouted him out very early in um, in the episode. And I, and I might've mentioned his name a couple of times. We we, we, we talk about Shecky a little bit, Rick Sheckman, uh, who is, I mean, if you've listened to, I really, I don't know if there's an episode that goes by where I don't mention Shecky at least once. Uh, Shecky is in many respects, uh, the North star of the Letterman podcast. This show would not exist if it wasn't for him and many other things too, but Shecky uh, gets a, gets a, a bit of a, a higher um, credit for that. Uh, Rick Sheckman is a, he's a guy that I have developed a friendship with um, for the last few years um, uh, you know, we talk at least weekly, if not more. And, uh, I just appreciate him very, very, very much. And he's in the hospital right now. So right now, um, everybody who's listening or watching the Letterman podcast, let's just stop for a second. We're going to say, get well, Shecky. That's what we're going to do. We're all going to send healing energy towards Shecky and love and, um, really nice intentions towards those who love, uh, uh, Rick Sheckman. And by the way, I wouldn't know jerry or jeff if it wasn't for shecky shecky was the one that um provided intro or provided the the contact info for both these guys and and it was his suggestion um you know as as he helped me uh kind of blueprint what this thing is going to look like uh if it wasn't for him talking about these two guys at the near the very beginning um <clears throat> i wouldn't know them and so i'm really really grateful for him and so i'm gonna stop talking now because this is not what you're here for it jumps right into it uh the letterman podcast is proud to present brought to you by in fact the hello deli go to hello-deli.com uh i'm thinking about rupert right now as well let's all uh throw some throw some awesome energy to rupert as well go to hello-deli.com if you want to order any late show with david letterman merchandise um, or Rupert merchandise for that matter, or just one heck of a sandwich. <laughs> Sorry for the spastic intro here. Um, yeah, without further ado, the Letterman podcast are proud to present the first mashup episode featuring Gerard Mulligan and Jeff Martin. <laughs> 
Okay, we're talking about Hurley's. Uh, this is the this is the experimental first of hopefully many Letterman podcast mashups where we have uh, folks who either work together or maybe didn't work together. And uh, Jeff Martin, Gerard Mulligan here on the Letterman podcast. That's all we're getting for an intro. Don Giller's here right now. We'll see if he pops in and out. And uh, Gerard was just telling stories uh, about the legendary Hurley's and how Hurley's was built. Uh, the bar sitting right outside 30 Rock forever which is now apparently a bakery it's apparently a bakery yeah, everything everything changes Hurley's yeah Hurley's did move and I think we might have had my retirement party there I don't remember we had it at some bar I remember and uh it was you know what can I say it was a it was a retirement although I kept I kept forcing my way back onto the show <laughs> but it was fun because I would just be here in my uh my mansion here in New Jersey and they would send a black car to me and I, they would drive me into Midtown. I would do the show. I would hang around after rehearsal. I would get do the show, get free dinner with the writers in the writer's room and, and come back to New Jersey and not have to worry about writing another top 10 item or another monologue joke. It was perfect. A very different experience than when you and Jeff shared an office together. Um, yeah, the, the, right. the ending was very different than the beginning. That's right. But not only that, but we also went on a lecture tour, a series of lectures at colleges across the country. And uh, back in uh, 87, I guess, 87 or 88. And we didn't realize, I guess uh, students realize this, there's this extortionary thing when you go to college, at least in the States, called like the Student Activity Fund or something like this, where a lot, big chunk of money comes, <laughs> you have to pay as part of your tuition, I guess. And they accumulate this vast amount of wealth and so they pay, you know, people like us who are more than happy to snatch the money from the students and fly us around. <laughs> we went to play. We went to Texas and Pittsburgh and Florida, we went to all kinds of Erie, places. Pennsylvania, and uh, Syracuse and Syracuse. A lot of garden spots. I had my <laughs> I had my first fajita with you, Jeff, at San, in San Marcos, Texas. I remember. Remember, I think we went to San Marcos State. I remember, yeah, my my uh, my home state. Yes. That's right. Well, and, they uh, say you never forget your first. Um, uh, yeah, I don't remember. I, I remember it very well. <laughs> well, uh, I, I remember about those. Uh, it, it was a real look at just how popular the show was because we would get we would get packed uh, enthusiastic houses if if they didn't charge money to see us. <laughs> if they charged a couple of bucks, there'd be a lot of empty seats. Well, they'd already paid. And I remember two things about the Syracuse thing. That was our very first one. Mm -hmm. The editing looked like it had been done by a blind man in the dark, if you recall. <laughs> we put the clips together on, like, on a phone or something. It was just unbelievably raw. And uh, after the lecture, whatever it was, I, a kid came up from the, the audience and said, I, you were best man at my father's wedding, which was true. It was a friend of mine from Providence. The oh. other thing, you and I were at a pizza place afterwards. Mm -hmm. A bunch of students came by and applauded us. This this I remember very well. It, it was very nice and a, a similar story when we were at uh, I think Florida State University, Florida, Florida. Okay, early early on, um, uh, we said I, I said as a joke. You know, I was talking to Dave yesterday. He said if you guys give us a good reception, we're going to do an entire week of shows from the campus <laughs> of Florida University. <laughs> And the thing, I was kidding, and and the 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 kids went bonkers. <laughs> like, I remember, it, and uh, it was sort of uh, uh, you know, well, by the time they realize they they've been had, we'll be a thousand miles away. I guess. That's, right. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, my son went to grad school in writing at, at at University of Florida, and this is to tell you how how the situation has changed. We were checking into the hotel, and I was telling the receptionist, you know, the last time I was here. The big news on campus was Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith was their Heisman Trophy running back at the University of Florida. And I came and I told him, blah, blah, blah. And she sort of went, Emmett Smith, Letterman? Okay, yeah, sure. Not a not a blip, not a blip. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it was true, it was just madness. It was just madness, I remember. And it's like, wow, this is fun. I'm gonna remember this, this for a while, sure. Mm -hmm. The um actually when when we had jeff on uh our show one of the things that 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 came up was the idea that you guys were really um you had your heads down you were working so hard on the show and it was uh one of the one of the watermarks was when you went to california 
and you had people who were yeah. waiting outside all night long. Oh yeah, you guys were crazy. part of that where you didn't really necessarily know what was happening outside of the walls of the studio or the writer's room. And, and then suddenly you're seeing when you're on these university tours or you're seeing when you travel out to LA or whatever, the actual impact that the show was making on, I mean, people of all ages, but especially the college crowd. Um, that must've been just a surreal feeling. Yeah, it is true. It's so like really working on the show. Meryl, Meryl said about the morning show, writing new material is like chasing a runaway truck downhill and trying to catch it. It's really true. It's just like you need what for when and they're five days a week and that's a lot of material, you know. And then we went to California and it was lines around the block and at Studio City. I mean, it, it was Television City we went to in, uh, down to Fairfax. And I remember we went to Universal. We, we did it at the Universal, one anniversary show, whatever, Universal Amphitheater in, uh, in LA, outside of LA. And a bunch of uh, Japanese or uh, Koreans, I don't remember, came up to me and said, oh, I see you from television. I said, really, you watch you. It turned out they were near an army base, a US army base, and the armed forces TV was carrying the show. And then one more self-referential story. I took the kids to Disney World. I took the kids to Disney World. I probably even couldn't afford to now, given whatever. <laughs> and we're walking along. There's a garbage can. They have movable garbage cans, and they had a movable garbage can come up to me. I said, "Do I recognize you from the Letterman show?" <laughs> I said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, I guess. Sure. Don't, don't, don't try anything. Yeah, sure. Anyway." Well, I was lucky. I was behind clown makeup uh, <laughs> half the time I was on the show. So that Funky the Clown was still one of my favorite bits of anybody on the show, Jeff. That that just makes oh, me thanks. laugh. Just just thinking about those appear, I just makes me laugh out loud. Oh, that's not well. I'll, I'll tell you, it's it. I, I should say it's absurd that I'm here again because I, I was on the show last month uh, with. I know. Uh, yeah. Know. Well, well, I, yes. I, Mike asked me to do it. I listened to a couple, including your episode, and I, I thought, okay, you know, these these old Letterman memories, as much as I cherish them, they're not of general interest. But I thought for this host and for this podcast, no detail is too small, no no story is too obscure. So I just I went on for three hours. I just thought, okay, this is a <laughs> chance to say everything I have to say. About about the Letterman show, and by the third hour, I, I couldn't could barely put a sentence together. I was like, crying at one point, like, like like the last season of The Office, where they were just like we attacked. I'm, I'm sorry. I prefer to say I'm I'm like James Brown. I'm, I'm somebody giving putting it all out there. You know? <laughs> That's right. Every show, every leaving show. leaving it all on the stage and all that and and you know we i did talk for three hours and and at the end it, okay that's it that was great that, that's <laughs> all i have to say Wait, i'm done i'm done and 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 uh two weeks later mike called <laughs> <laughs> nothing has happened you know, says so like hey come back and 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 uh and, and do it with jerry you're you're kidding you're kidding you want me back to meet that that soon so it's it's uh it's jerry mulligan in a wrung out dish rag today <laughs> <laughs> uh, I respectfully I'm very disagree, happy to sir. see you, Jerry. I respectfully nice disagree. You, you know, um, lots of meat on that bone. Here's something that Don sent me right there. I don't know if you guys can see. Yeah, Plant Boy. There's Plant Boy right there. Yeah. Um, there are so many stories that, and, and again, our, our audience is growing like crazy, but the people who are in our audience already are certainly the ones who, uh, your description is perfect, uh, Jeff. Um, and I'll just add to that a little bit too. Like, like both of you would have experienced this, you know, uh, publications or productions would come to you and ask you about to, to tell a story or two about being a, a writer on Letterman. You'd get one little surfacey thing out of the way and they'd be, okay, well, thanks very, very much for being here. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they <laughs> shift off where it's like, no, 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 this, this crowd, uh, there's a, there's a, a giant, uh, group of people who have, uh, where, like you said, Jeff, no detail is too small. We love this stuff. The idea that you two shared an office together, like right there, it's like, oh my gosh, how did that work? Like, like what was it? Was there a collaboration? Was it you two would be on no. your little corners writing something and then you'd share with each other? Or there was, big no, there was like, how did that work? There was virtually no collaboration because I mostly did monologue stuff and Jeff did more sketch stuff. Uh, one thing we, we both enjoyed was music and we would play music a lot. 
And there was one, you want to get really obscure. There was one song we used to play like two or three times in a row. And it was uh, the Bodines. You know, the have you heard of the Bodines? It's a band from, it was very, very big with very few people. And there was one of their songs that we played, B-O-D-E-A-N-S. And uh, there was a song of theirs called, uh, I can't remember. It was the last one on their al- on one of their albums. But we used to play it over and over. We played the Edmund, record the Edmund Fitzgerald sometimes too, just for the, I guess for the narrative. I I, uh, I had written a cold opening that involved it. That's why we were listening to was it. Is that what it was? Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But but it, well, just real quickly, it was uh, there was a guest who kept getting bumped, and uh, uh, there was a cold opening where Dave was talking to Paul, and uh, well, he assured the guest he wouldn't be bumped this time. And then he's chatting with Paul and uh, Dave's in the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald comes up and Dave said, you know, I think I know all the lyrics to that. <laughs> <laughs> and he started saying them and time crept by and the guests look worried, you know, <laughs> so, but <laughs> no, we didn't collaborate much be- as, it, as Jerry said, be- we'd, we'd uh, show up and, and chat a little bit. And then uh, Jerry would have to write monologue jokes. Right. So he would, he right. would signal that he had to get to work by putting on headphones and, uh, listening to Counting Crows or the Bodines or, or whatever. And, and uh, that it just always impressed me that Jerry and Larry Jacobson would both churn out a couple yeah, of dozen true. monologue yeah. jokes every day. That, uh, well, speaking of guests getting bumped, when I briefly, I told this the last time that I briefly had to work as a segment producer, halftime and writing monologue the other half. And uh, the first guest I ever had to bump was Jerry Seinfeld, which I mean, unimaginable these days, I know. And he was a little upset, obviously. And he just said, that would never happen. This would never happen on Carson. And he was on Carson the next week. And guess what happened? <laughs> no, he did. He was fine. He went on. He was very funny. Right. But anyway, <laughs> the, the only and guess. Jeff was waiting for it. <laughs> the, the only Jerry guess, used to get me. Okay. I mean, another, and, uh, in the, just just uh, in the office between the two of us. Uh he he would Jerry's phone would ring. He'd answer it, and he'd, he'd say, "Oh, hi, sweetheart. It's Suzanne, who's my wife." <laughs> and, uh, he, By the way, he'd have that every time. <laughs> here's a piece of trivia that people, even the Dons, might not know. Jeff's wife and I have the same home state. We are both from the state of Rhode Island. Small right. but mighty, the ocean state. Yes. Well, we were both in the course of the show. We both uh, we both got married. We both uh, started families. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, I, I would have to say, Jerry, I don't think we ever had a crossword. Uh, if uh, no, we got along really. We were very compatible, and uh, I think the headphones had a lot to do with that. <laughs> Just a couple of a couple of you know, truth lies in the middle, guys. <laughs> Ineffectual, <laughs> easily led men. We had, yeah, we had a lot of interest in comedy, both like baseball very much, and. Uh, and music and, uh, and uh, a little bit of literature. I remember. I, I think early on, uh, yeah, I knew the final line of uh, Candide, and I think I went up in your estimation a little. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, very little. Yeah, but that's true. Yeah. Okay. And Don just popped on here, and usually there's a factoid or Sue when he, uh, oh, he jumps on. Obviously, uh, can I see everybody at once? Am I hitting? Am I not hitting the right? Uh, I think if you no? hit view and you see gallery or something like that, you should be able to. I, it should be up here, right? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Oh, there, there you are. are. Look at the Dons. He found something. He yeah. found something. And, I'll, I'll do, and, and and the moment has passed, so it's kind of pointless. That's all right. No, please. We're, we're talking about stuff that happened 40 years ago, Dons. <laughs> I, I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Um, yeah. <laughs> Seinfeld, uh, he was bumped, but he did appear the following day oh. on the show. So that's an, ampl- that's an amplification rather than a correction. Yeah, there oh, you go. Would... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll note the Rhode Island uh, factoid. That goes in the blog. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's another story. By the way, this just came out of nowhere, but a very funny story. You may have heard this already. If so, just feel free to edit it out. There was a tradition on the show when a writer would leave. And they were very, in the early days, they were very loose about this. You got a better offer in California. People would just come. And the tradition was you would go to Dave's secretary Laurie, yeah. or assistant, whatever, and make an appointment to talk to Dave after the show. And people pretty much knew what that was. So at one point, Kevin Curran did this. He said, I'm going to talk to, da- I'm going to, talk to Dave after the show. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> and he came in, and he said to Dave, 
Dave, uh, I'm leaving the show and I'm going to uh, work on, uh, oh, what the for children? Married with children. Did he go to Married with Children after that? Married yeah. with Children. Yes. And Dave said, oh, I believe the first part. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Hey, did yeah. you guys uh, did you guys ever hang out with the pickle? Uh, do we they had the pickle around the office a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I was probably in our office briefly. I don't think it was a a big part of our lives, frankly. I don't think I uh, heard you, Mike. Hang on. Oh, was did big, you uh, did, pickle? Any memories of the pickle? There's a giant pickle. Yeah, I, I did hear you correctly. I don't know what you're talking. about. <laughs> I don't remember where it came from. I think probably a promotional thing somebody sent in. People would send in strange things thinking, oh, David, love to put this on the air. <laughs> Obviously, having never seen the show before. <laughs> Seriously, it's just the ideas were like. No, it's pretty funny, Jerry. I, 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 wanna, I watched your uh, uh, Letterman Channel segment. Uh-huh. I did one as well. And uh, I, was, I was happy to see uh, I was in one of the bits where... Uh, it was, it was Dave just saying, you know, we're not going to do any stunts, even though it's sweeps month. And then, <laughs> that's, right, that's right. And then uh, I played a young man in the audience saying, you know, Mr. Letterman, my wife, she, she's about to have a baby or she's in labor, played by uh, Chris Elliott's wife, uh, Paula Nieder. And the baby was played by my son, Kevin. Well, yeah, I think that's the main reason you selected that. Or, or <laughs> I don't know. Here's what I don't remember. I misremember this, I guess. Don will probably correct me. Joan Rivers did a walk. I remember this very distinctly. Yeah, Joan Rivers did a walk on that show. Kevin had not been removed from the audience yet and was crying a lot. Do you remember this, Jeff? And Joan Rivers, as I remember, just said, oh, shut up. And I remember this very distinctly. <laughs> wow, that, vaguely. Honestly, I, think, I didn't remember the bit at all. I did not remember delivering uh, your son, uh, you know, <laughs> holding up your son on the air and saying, we're going to name him Dave. <laughs> and he, yeah, he was not most pleased. Well, first of all, he was in a diaper, which was a little the verisimilitude suffered. But also, the uh, it was freezing, in the, as everybody always mentions, it was freezing in the studio, and he was a he was a kid, he was a baby. But now Walter I, Walter said he could not find the Joan Rivers walking. It must have been a different show. But I'm no, it, it was, was maybe it was, not in a list anywhere because it was a walk on and she was not it, scheduled. But it, it, was, it was this, it was the same show. Uh, um, May 13th, 86, she had just left the Tonight Show. Right. And, and was blackballed from the Tonight Show. And 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 yeah, she came on in the second segment. The first segment was was Dave delivering the baby. Uh and then and then Joan Rivers <laughs> came on. Uh oh, no, let's see. I'm sorry. Yeah. In the second segment, uh audience member is pregnant, Dave delivers Kevin, and and then Joan came out. And um, she did tell him to shut up. You remember that? There's part yeah. of family lore, so I can't go back and change it now. So I'm sorry. I have I have a, a a Joan Rivers compilation that starts with that with that uh, segment with her in it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Now it's funny, Jerry, because I I saw I had forgotten that bit, but I, I thought, oh, this is very much like uh, the family circus bit that that you did. That oh I God. wrote. Maybe I wrote it with you. I pro but, well, yeah, but, I think you you probably right. I wrote very little of that kind of stuff. But but, but yeah, uh, it was. It, what, it, what it was was just G Letterman was saying, you know, you don't have to put on a big fancy show with stunts and, and all that sort of thing. You, you can keep it small. And he brought out Jerry. And, and the, the notion was that Jerry's hobby was collecting uh, family circus cartoons, just this very anodyne single panel cartoon strip that ran forever. And it's just Jerry. They're, they're all very gentle, soft laughs. It's just, and it's just Jerry sharing some of his favorites. And Dave saying, "This is this is all you, this is all you need. You don't need any more than this to, to entertain folks." And then uh, at a certain point, uh, Dave's assistant Lori Diamond in a showgirl outfit runs out and says, "Mr. Letterman, that girder looks like it's about to fall." <laughs> what? And, uh, the girder <laughs> falls on Jerry. You know, Jerry's heart is stopped, and Dave, you know, come on, you know, pushes on his heart. Damn you, live, live. <laughs> you know. And, and, that guy, I think, I think that's how it went, something like that. Yeah, and and it, I, I'm watching it, and I just think, like, boy, that's that's uh, just remembering it. I'm thinking, when I played the actor singer, a girder hit me on the head. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, when, there was a when Dave fired you in Las Vegas, do you remember that bit? Yeah, you I do very well. We were doing the week of shows in Las <laughs> Vegas. Dave fired you. We had a montage of you going out of the casino, hitting a jackpot, putting it all on the and, and within a minute, you're walking back on stage with a showgirl on each arm, smoking That's a right. cigar. And I remember that minute was, and, and Biff was kind of down. Susan Hum was getting me into the tuxedo. <laughs> and, and, and it was just oh, like okay. crazy. And Biff was going, 10 seconds, five seconds. We're over, we're over, we're over. And I so came just, out, just, I finally came out. Just a little bit, just a little bit late, yeah. I remember <laughs> another Bill Keen thing, by the way, where I brought out a big scrapbook of Bill Keen, and I was talking to Dave about it. And for, remember this? And for some reason, yeah, an, Esk crossbow. Esk an Eskimo stood up in the audience <laughs> and threw a harpoon, <laughs> threw a harpoon at me. And I held up the book, and it it's it saved my life. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's let's thank Bill Keen. You know, yeah. <laughs> And Bill Keen, Bill Keen got in touch with me, and it was very awkward tightrope, you know. Uh, we were basically saying it's not really that, that funny, but yeah, you're really mocking, but you're not mocking, like it's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it yeah. was very like everybody grew up watching, everybody grew up within the family. They were kids, you know. It's not like it influenced anybody the way Mad Magazine did, but it was a family thing. Everybody thought around it. And but, when he said to me, "By the way, Jared, I'd love to send you an original drawing. What, do you, what would you like? Who would you like?" I didn't remember. I didn't know any of the characters on the strip, and I just said, "Geez, let me get back to you." So I just, you know, went through, went through a book, and he said, "Well, I don't have that one." I said, "How about this one on page?" And he goes, "Yeah, okay, I'll send you that." So I have a, I have a black and white drawing of uh, one of the unnamed kids sliding down a, a a slide in a playground, saying something that's not as funny as it should be. <laughs> well, well, Jerry, I was I was just remembering that stuff to make the point. Just going through a few pieces in my head of, okay, we don't need big gimmicks. And then we did go for a big gimmick that involved uh, uh, showgirls and getting hit with girders. <laughs> and it made me wonder, were, were we constantly thinking of new bits or uh, constantly uh, dressing up old bits and slightly was, newer clothing? You know? It was so, exactly. It was so, it was getting what we call refillables was, the, was like the, the, the gold under the, under the uh, floorboard somewhere. And once we got one, like viewer mail was like, this is like sent from heaven. This is just like they generate these setup, these elaborate setups, and we either have a p a, a comedy piece built on the letter. That's how I got fired. Mostly it was off viewer mail letters. Well, we did what I'm embarrassed to use this term. What we call snappies, which was just just a, like a joke response to somebody, a phrase, no no production at all. Just well. That's what I said to your wife, something like that. And boom, it was like that. That was it. And snappies. We like more produced things. They, they, they tended to play better. Another thing that we, we thought would be an interesting thing to try was cold closes. Remember that we did a few cold closes where like Bill Wonder would be walking in the empty studio or, and it turned out nobody watched. It turns out <laughs> everybody in America turns off the show as soon as uh, the credits start rolling. Oh man, I I love those. Like when Dave would go and uh, everybody would have like a little uh, like a homestead uh, patio outside of their office, and you know, good night, good night. He would go home home for the night. Right. I, love that. I enjoy those too. Yeah, I love that shit. Um, now, Jerry, on your first uh, on on your on your first interview with Mike, uh, you my boy. You, you said that they used to um, do. They Dave used to call, eventually would call for it. Uh, a, an alternate top 10 list sometimes during yes. the show. This was at, this was at, uh, I remember it happening. In, I can visualize very clearly the writer's room and uh, I mean, at CBS and we'd be eating around, watching the show, eating stuff from the, you know, outside of the restaurant eating and the phone would ring and not, it, it was almost always ominous. It'd be like 10, because he just, sometimes he just read the top 10 and it didn't play as well as he thought it should. Well, he was looking at over and going, yeah, I don't think so. And we need a new topic. And this was like at six o'clock for the 5.30 taping. Well, I, I had a bunch of thoughts hearing. And first you said you, you guys used to get a catered meal every night, which is like, well, wait, we didn't, we didn't do that no, today. <laughs> well, at some point, we, we were ordering from a restaurant. I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't a big like craft service. It, it, it never that. occurred to me to say, hey, Letterman, where's my food? When, when I was working on the show, we, we fed ourselves. <laughs> yes. No self-reliance. Yeah, but, 
but but I, it would just a, a chill went down my spine at the thought of uh, doing <laughs> another top ten list. You know, during the show after after oh, the yeah. show had begun, it tape. was scary. When I when I when I left the show, you know, I, I was uh, uh, had all sorts of sad feelings about going, but but the my main number one uh, thing I felt okay, I don't have to do any more top ten lists. <laughs> I felt the same way. I never want to write anything about Britney Spears again, as long as I live. <laughs> again, not asking for sympathy. It's it's it's, I, it's, no, I don't not, it's not heavy lifting. But my honest my honest uh, uh, thought that I would console myself with if I was sad about leaving was, I don't have to do any more top ten lists because it just kept coming up every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And David periodic would say, "Okay, that's it. No more top ten lists." And within a couple of weeks, he would always go back to them. But speaking of the writers' room, I thought of something. We once, and I think this was at NBC, we had a visit in the writer's room from a clown. Do you remember this? I can't, I think I had the, I had the name written down somewhere, but at any rate, he was a clown. He had a male stripper was, once. I remember that, but, but go on. Was, yeah. <laughs> this was a clown who was in Capturing the Freedmen's. Do you remember capturing the Freedmen's documentary about the Freedmen? Yes, I do. Yeah, the son was, uh, was a birthday. One of the sons was a clown, Fuzzy the Clown or Fuzzy the Clown. And I guess he he somehow got his way into our the building and tried to pitch himself as a for something like we <laughs> know we're, we're good, but he did show up in the writers' room. And, wow, I remember uh, the scene from the movie very clearly, but not not from yeah. real. Yeah, he was in our show. He was in our show. Now, uh, hey Jerry, could I could I share uh, one 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 thing on the show that I did write for you? That sure. no one will know because Dave didn't didn't uh, want to do it. But it was uh, back when uh, Mike Tyson was the heavyweight champ. Right. So I got a magazine article uh, following him around, and uh, among the things he did during that day was appear on Letterman. And in the article, it said like as Tyson was leaving to get on the elevator, a pretty Letterman staffer slipped him a phone number. So you know, I read the article. You're always looking for something to uh, uh, yeah. write a piece about. So I said, hmm, "Well, maybe Dave tries to get to the bottom of it." So he has three staffers on. They're all in silhouette, so they only see their silhouettes. And it was Lori Diamond, Lori Guthrie, and and your distinctive silhouette uh, 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 sitting on stools. I, Does this ring a bell at all? Not at all. And, okay, okay, good. Uh, well, we never did. We never did it, right? We didn't do it, but I remember it. Uh, okay, and and uh, and Dave would ask questions like, uh, "How would you describe yourself, Lori? One normal, no, Lori two, happy, and then get to you, and you'd say pretty. <laughs> <laughs> How would wow. you describe Mike Tyson, boxer, fighter, you know, irresistible love god? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you get you get the idea. You, you yeah, were the right. pretty Letterman staffer who slipped him the phone number, and uh, it was funny in my head. But but uh, I think Dave. Just, I think it's funny. Dave had weird objections to stuff. You know, uh, I thought, I think he thought maybe he didn't want to put a spotlight on this incident, which I bet didn't even happen. But uh, yeah, well, yeah. By the way, there was, speaking of things that never happened, when I retired, there was a little item in, I think, Michael Starr, whoever it was in the Inquirer. Every item, of, every factual item of which was wrong. My name was Gerald in the front instead of Gerard. Uh, there was something else, blah, 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 blah. And the, the final thing was, as, as he left, Letterman muttered to him, I better not catch you writing for Leno. <laughs> Every single fact, there may be five factable, fact checkable things that were that were wrong. Just to, up to that point, I'd taken the tabloids as Bible, frankly. And now, <laughs> when Conan got famous, yeah, uh, like he 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 told me a couple of weeks in, uh, there was some gossip item that he'd been making out in public, you know, with with some girl. <laughs> I know you know, it's some store, and and he just said. Nope, <laughs> did not I know. Happen. Yeah, this it's amazing, and it's not worth suing about, obviously. And you'd have to prove damages. And in fact, there's no damages in that. It's just not true. It's just you know, it's Fox, it's Foxian, it's Fox Newsian, or whatever. I yeah. love the idea that Rupert Murdoch says, "Yeah, we told them, we knew it was fake, but you know, we had to satisfy the advertisers, so you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever. We're not, we don't call ourselves really a news." Or, Oh, we do call ourselves news, but nobody believes it. Yeah, sure. Don, did you have a question? Uh, I was going to show this. 
Oh, I have that. Wow, I have I have that downstairs wow. on my couch. That that was the one that Mike held a photo of of Kevin being terrorized. Yeah, yeah. Let me show you something. I love that one. <laughs> love that one. That's Jerry as Batman. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and uh, when he when he appeared as Batman on the show, and it's a it's a grainy figure, but Jerry is giving the uh, modest uh, superhero salute, <laughs> like you know, right, sleep well, citizens. I'm I'm on the job. <laughs> and uh, but I I look I look quite like that is the most excited and exciting moment of my life. Yeah, you should as well. You should. Yeah, well, yeah. it's Batman. Yeah, I Batman mean, God. Um, well okay, should. so Jerry writing monologue jokes jeff doing a lot of the uh the production type stuff the the, the sketches and and things and and that would be thrown into the show viewer mail that kind of a thing um how would it come up to write things for jerry like like i asked joe grossman this the other day when he was on and, and you know the idea that a lot of right like joe would never write himself anything but the idea that other writers thought it was funny to put joe into these situations and they would love to write for him and have him on there um then you have chris elliott of course too who's you know a part of things and driving uh his own bus uh as as, as well um how would these well, things come up oh go ahead jerry jerry was just a, a very likable presence on screen on on his um uh on his letterman channel segment you did the one where uh you were a segment producer for levon helm and he, he got stuck in traffic. So Letterman had you on instead and you were just talking about the, the very, and you, you, uh, it, it was something that was edited out that I remember very clearly was, uh, Dave asked. So like the band, uh, what are, what are some of their famous songs? And you said, well, uh, one in particular would be, uh, I guess up on cripple Creek. And there was a smattering of applause in the audience. And you said, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember two things about that. My wife to be, that was the first time she'd seen me on television, couldn't have been more nervous. It was like me going to my 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 son's first little league game, you know, my daughter's <laughs> recital. It's just you can't do anything. You just you know, and you're nervous. I was I I very I never had very much stage fright. The other thing, when I came off, when I came off stage, Jack Rollins was backstage and said, that was the best thing we've ever done on the show so far. That's what the show is supposed to be about. I might as well, you know, not to brag, but I think it was because it was in the spirit of the show that, you know, it was done very, very spontaneously because his manager was there, who was Gene Levy's uncle, coincidentally. He didn't know where Levon was. Levon, he, his story was that his car, his truck wouldn't start. He was, he lived in Woodstock and his truck wouldn't start. And it was like, was his, was his phone brought? I just think that was the story. I don't know what, I don't know what it was. But I do remember I, had, I was asking, uh, I asked Steve Jordan, I guess, who was the drummer, is it hard to sing and play drums at the same time? I just, for some reason, that fascinated me that somebody would be able to do that. Well, what, what he did, what, what Steve then did was 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 sing, play drums and sing The Weight. Uh, and then into the oh, commercial that's break. That's right. Into the and, commercial break, the band played The Weight. That's a great, that's a great, that's Paul was so good at that. Paul was so good with playing on music and picking yeah. up stuff. Like he and, would play, when I first played Kim Jong-il, he played uh, UB <laughs> Owen, the Beastie Boys. I was like, do you, do you remember when we had uh, uh, Mishu? He was, he was like the world's smallest fan. <laughs> yes, I do. And, and going uh, from Ringling Brothers and going into commercial, Paul and the band played Miss You. Miss You. Rolling <laughs> Stones Miss You. And there was one that I thought it was a joke I thought of, and I put it on Twitter as a joke, and I I think I did come up with it. But Paul simultaneously had the same thing because when Tony Danza was on, he played him on with Tiny Dancer. Because <laughs> I'd written a joke. I, I didn't remember that, or maybe subconsciously, but I remember writing a, a joke on Twitter or Facebook about, uh, oh, I understand Tony Danza was very disappointed to find out the name of the song was actually Tiny Dancer. <laughs> But anyway, uh, yeah, Paul. Was I, I remember. I, I won't say who it was for, but they would uh, play the Rolling Stones' uh, "Stupid Girl." I was going to mention that. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to mention the name either. But well, yeah. but, but, but when... Jerry, I brought up just that you know, seeing you like do that Levon Hel Helm thing, and you know, be quick witted and just appealing on camera, and, and just uh, oh, a, a big lovable guy and the well, John Candy, Dan Blocker, <laughs> Elvis Skipper um, old, you know. 
That's a <laughs> that's a big pair of pants to fill. Believe me. <laughs> Don, I, I, Don's got either correction or amplification. <laughs> no, 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 no corrections. Um, uh, when you acknowledged the crowd and the crowd applauded and Dave cracked up that you were taking credit for the song, uh, that that I, may, maybe the the uh, anyway it, it it's in the broadcast. Uh, that was that wasn't taken out of the broadcast. No, oh, it was and, taken out on the Letterman Channel. Yeah, yeah. I was and, waiting and, for that. Oh, they, and, they, and, oh that's too bad. You know, you one had, of the funniest things done, I've ever. One of the funniest things I've ever heard Dave say, and this was in a, in a monologue rehearsal or something. No, it was on the air, actually. And it, it was because if you, you know Dave's persona, and he had Matthew Broderick on. You remember the, Matthew Broderick on? And so he said, how are you doing? My house? busy day. <clears throat> well, you know, I came out, of, I live in the West Village. I came out of my house. Every, the street was blocked off. There were cops everywhere, blah, blah, blah. And she said, Dave said, real seriously, what was going down? <laughs> it's just like yeah, Dave's like what was going down like he was in a really shitty detective show or something yeah. just me. now yeah. first Jerry Jerry I wasn't calling you fat I was calling you big I also that's like, fine I also I've used lost, Dan Blocker as an example all right I've lost about 50 pounds since the show because of the free meals now that I'm not <laughs> now that I do all the cooking you were big you were big for sure and uh oh, I was big you were a big, big, big heart of gold, gentle giant, you know, that that sort of vibe. So I, I think it was always, uh, let's, 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 well, uh, Dave Thomas wrote a memoir of SCTV where he said they all recognized early on with John Candy. They all said, let's get that big, lovable face on the camera as much as possible. <laughs> People totally are just, okay. plain, just plain happy to, to I think, see him. I, th I think Chris Farley was the same way. And, you know, I just, I read his, his brother wrote a biography and it's just, he was so sad most of the time. It just broke my heart to read that. Yeah. I mean, he was so, maybe he was very athletic. He would make that entrance where he would cartwheel and jump, run up the aisle and stuff and just be hysterical. Everything he did was when he played Andrew Giuliani. Do you remember that? <laughs> when, when Rudolph Giuliani's son was, was acting up at the inauguration. Yeah. <laughs> running around and stuff he played Andrew Giuliani on SNL oh my god that was, that was just so funny Jeez. now well I will say uh, Jerry uh just a, 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 do you remember Jerry that I used to say you should get into politics does this ring a bell vaguely yeah uh, okay well what the, the bit was uh just just because I said you know Jerry has this appealing everyman quality people are happy to see him and I started uh and uh, Jerry also had a very lovable Irish mother, Rita, Rita. who I met a few right. times. And I, I just was saying, like, Jerry, this this will be your gimmick. But talking as if it was <laughs> early 20th century Boston. <laughs> and, and, it's and, true. A, it's a Mayor really James true. Curley thing. You remember this? Because I, I just say, Jerry, we'll get you up there in front of the crowd with your mother. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and you, you'll say, you're still me best girl, Ma. <laughs> Does this ring a bell? Oh, I remember. No? I don't remember that line, but yeah, that I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, the South, the South Boston Pauls, and yeah, I, I'd say get up there, Jerry, and with get up there with Rita. Say you're still me, best girl, Ma, and then she'll say to the crowd, uh, uh, you know, if you vote for me, boy, Jerry, uh, you'll be making no mistake. That kind of <laughs> yeah, Rita was on on Parents Night, and she kissed Howard Cosell. So oh. That that, that was an estrangement between us for a while. I think she did it on camera in Dave's office. Here we go. Here's Look the impressiveness of Don Giller right here, by the way. Look at this guy. I know. Like, 1986. Uh, there it is, Parents' Night. Anyway, you my parents from that night, Don? Uh, I'll check. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Don, I really appreciate I, I, I know people tell you this all the time. I really appreciate what you do. I remember my for one of the many examples. My daughter had a new boyfriend who had never seen her appearance <clears throat> in staff stories in the oh, uh, in the brownie yeah. uniform. I DM'd you. You had it up in like literally <laughs> minutes, and it was so appreciated. I have no life. Yeah, your daughter was so adorable. Yes, there's a picture of her backstage. The, the brownie, yeah. Oh my God! And you in the we you and you in the brownie uh, costume. And, yeah, that was I was fetching in a totally different way. Well, <laughs> when, 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 when you needed to put someone in costume, 
Uh, we would call on you a lot. I remember uh, there was life-size Hummel figures. <laughs> and it was you. And do you remember this? And Dave says, now, who are you? And you, your line was, uh, little Hans, the goat herd. <laughs> <laughs> and and another time, it was a viewer mail bit of Dave thinking about, oh, the guys in the band. And he, he pans past thinking about all of them. And uh, it's Will and Paul and Sid. And then it continues with, with band members we've never seen. <laughs> and there you were uh, uh, holding a tuba, and it was right. that guy, you know, and yeah. and uh, again wearing uh, lederhosen. So that's right. And that's uh, right. it's five minutes to air. We don't have anything. <laughs> Yet Mulligan and lederhosen. <laughs> that's what that was. Speaking of leader lederhosen, I don't know why. I used to leave the show sometimes early to make a bus back to Nutley, go down Fifty Third Street, race to the Port Authority, Eighth Avenue. One day I was doing that. I forgot that David had a camera out on 53rd Street that day for some, you know, going to spray pedestrians or something. I don't know. And he said, Whoa, hello, Gerard. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Dave. Gotta go. Gotta go. Got a bus to catch the night. I used to race Dave Dorsett, the cameraman to the Port Authority, because he lived in Jersey too. And uh, we were going to, I went down 8th Avenue one time. I don't know if this is going to be a play on uh, without the visual. They had a drug dealer busted at uh, 8th Avenue and 43rd, a block up from the Port Authority. He's handcuffed behind his back. And he hops all around. And as I walk by, he mouths to me, smokes, smokes. <laughs> I swear to God, it's like, well, that's brass balls, man. You got to hand to that guy. Uh, Jeff, you, your folks were there. I'm, I'm getting a screen capture for you now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. No, I know they were there and I know the picture exists. And I think uh, actually on some recent Facebook post where Jerry had the picture of, of himself and his mom, uh, I think I replied with, hey, I got one too. I think you do. That's right. That's right. Hang on. Any, any minute. He's going to send it say... over to me and I'll, I'll show it. This is, by the way, this is exactly what I envisioned. Um, uh, with this, I don't get me wrong. I prepped just in case. I knew I wouldn't <laughs> need to prep because this is just exactly what we were hoping is, for. Just loose. Well, you, um, this is this is chaos. Mike, please, I'm talking to Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, absolutely. David, one of my favorite lines that I still use that David used to say: "If the show was just a just you know shambolic, it was just like a chaos." We go, you know, Paul. This rehearsal is going very well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sometimes you know the, the pipes are exploding or something. Yeah. You no, know, Alan, this, this rehearsal is going very well. I Disaster shows a, were the best shows. Um, I think he had an I, un he's, he made an uh, politically incorrect comment once, like this is like Mexican television. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, okay, if we really want to go for granular memories, Jerry, uh, there's the parents. Oh, there's the parents right there. Let's show them. Oh hey! Oh okay! Oh that hey! Is that nice? There's my mom. That's a handsome. Dad. That's a handsome family there. Yeah, yeah, they're still around. Atta boy, Don. Yeah. Thank you for that. My mom and dad. Okay, let's really go granular. Let's do it. Boy, this oh guy. no! Well, just just uh, that I would I would be trying to get you into uh, early 20th century machine politics. Uh, I was also. Do you remember uh, Paul Penalino? Who was Paul uh, Penalino directs uh, uh, John Oliver now. He directs John Oliver. He, he was an associate director on uh, John Stewart's Today, uh, the Daily Show, Daily Show for for yeah. years and years. And great Samantha, guy. great, great guy, wonderful guy. And uh, back in the eighties, he was he was like a cute young uh, Italian guy, That's right. of Italian heritage. And uh, I and uh, I would talk about how I'm I'm going to turn him into a teen idol, as if it was. <laughs> Early 1960s, <laughs> just like all the Paul, I'm going to stick you in a tuxedo and uh, we'll go over to the Brill Building. We'll get a couple of tunes, and uh, it'll, it'll, you know, you'll be another Frankie Avalon. <laughs> I remember, I remember Paul Penalino when he first came out as, as a stage manager. He just gotten his his DGA card, and I don't know if it was him or somebody else. I mean, you might have heard this story, Mike, and I'm sure the Dons knows it. We had to bump somebody from 30 something and i'm thinking it was melanie mayron if somebody shecky corrected me on this i think it's melanie mayron okay you get that she's going to be bumped you have a new stage manager not familiar with the lingo on the show and we're running over time she has to be bumped coincidentally willie nelson's tour bus was parked on 53rd street okay so the stage manager hears in his ear from jerry Fuller in the control room 
tell Melanie Mayron she's on the bus. <laughs> so the kid, you can just fit, you can figure out the rest of it. We're in the airlock and we see a, a befuddled <laughs> Mayron. I think maybe Paul Pettigrew might go, I don't know. The director just says you're on the bus. He takes her out to 53rd Street and puts her on Willie Nelson's tour bus. And that's, that was the end of it. We didn't have a follow up because <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. Well, you didn't need a follow up. Um, no, that's true. There, okay, there's something I want to go back to really, really, really quick. Um, sure. I do have a list of questions just in case, but but this is something that I, I do love because it's a theme that's come up. It came up with O'Donnell, and it, I think it came up with both of you as well. The thing I loved about the late night audience, which did translate over to late show audience, but it's the late night audience that developed this, was the idea that you guys would put on something that could be uh, Jerry getting fired is a perfect example of it. Some of the patriotic things that uh, that would go on is another perfect example of it. You'd have this audience that was ready to catcall, ready to be cynical, ready to be, you know, um, uh, distrustworthy of things. But then you would also bring it around. Like if it was Jerry getting fired, you know, Dave would be going on his tirade and all that. And Jerry, I mean, he, he would look down and, and cheapish and all of that. And genuine empathy would actually start to come from the oh, audience. And oh, the, the joke audience. was there. Same with the patriotism, too. It'd be clearly you're mocking patriotism. But then it would come back around and the patriotic feelings would be there as I, well. I understand. I understand. As you writers, know, I... did you understand or did you know that? Like, Were you cognizant of it? Or is it only with reflection that that let the layers kind of reveal themselves yeah in the in the moment you're not too aware of everything you know by the way that getting fired if i recall i replaced an elderly paul elderly and guy. on your letterman channel yeah henry paul henry, andor the oldest actor henry, we and, paul andor, paul paul andor, andor yeah absolutely right and he, he passed, sadly he passed away and i just <laughs> i was standing eagerly <laughs> in the wings <laughs> yeah well that was that that uh, Something I wanted to bring up when you're talking about uh, uh, Levon Helm uh, uh, non-appearance, uh, I think it was the it was the segment where Dave fires you, and and you're found hanging in in the in the uh, 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 in the hallway, you're you're, you're hung, and and yeah. everyone everyone is kind of shocked, and then yeah, they and were Dave it was says, kind of shocking actually, yeah. And then Dave my kids, says, no, my no, kids no. were disappointed when I walked in the door that night. You walked that's back. Not the, that's not the point, really. I don't remember well, no, that being. Was... I don't remember that being the same show, but I do remember we did a whole series of me getting fired. One of yeah. my favorites was I wound up as uh, after he fired me, I wound up on a segment of Phil Donahue. All right, that was the last about, one about terrible bosses and how they mistreated their, <laughs> their workers or whatever. What, what I want, what I what I was thinking of was. Um... When you came back into the studio and, and everyone said, OK, it's just an act. And 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 Dave says, look, he's fine. And he says, thank you. And and you say, OK, good night, everybody. And that that cracked Dave up because you were sort of taking charge. Um, <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. That's enough. That's enough. And, and Mike, I just sent you a picture of uh, of, of uh, Jer Jerry with the, tu with the tuba, I think. That looks it, more like a baritone horn, but yes, there it is, right there. there it is. is it a tuba or a fugal horn? Oh yeah, I well, see that. It's, uh, it might be a. Yeah. Let, me show, let me show you something. I'll be I'll be right back. Talk among yourselves. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. But, now we're. But, uh, I've gotten that very idea, used though. to Jerry doing half the talking. It's uh, <laughs> this is much more restful than than the last time I was on. This, huh? this is what the writers gave me when I retired. Notice it's me and my later hosen. Oh, right. <laughs> on a bus, <laughs> on my way, on my way to Nutley. That would be little Hans the goat herd, rather than little Hans the goat herd. That's right. Because you're not you holding uh, a flugelhorn. Yeah. Speaking, Jerry, would you like to create that. backstories for all these characters? You know, just uh... <laughs> That's a, there's a Bible. There's a Bible for these things. Um, I remember one time, I was I was in Dave's office, and he said, uh, "Gerard, I don't know if you saw the show last night." Uh, I know during the taping, you were probably on the on the bus to Nutley, but uh, I used one of your lines from our private conversation. And I said, what are you talking about? She says, well, do you remember when you were talking about uh, Jessica Savage? This is a very odd story, by the way. I get a phone call in the middle of the night in my little loft on, on 23rd Street, sleeping loft. This is the NBC switchboard, uh, Jessica Savage from Mr. Gerard Mulligan. I said, okay. 
Miss Savage. Uh, Ms. Savage, why the hell wasn't I on the show tonight? What the hell's going on over there? Uh, I was like, I thought I explained, and the talent coordinators explained this show was taped tonight for tomorrow night. You'll be on tomorrow night. Well, nobody told me. She hung up. So when I told that when I told that story to David, I said, uh, "So I said, well, what can I? How can I help you, Jessica?" She said, "Well, you know, Gerard, I'm a newswoman, but I'm also a woman." Okay. <laughs> he said, "I said, I used that same line last night about Barbara Walters. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember the context, but he used it about Barbara Walters." <clears throat> Anyway. Jerry, you're doing the segment producing, you know, pre-interviewing the guests. That was yeah. all very mysterious to me because I, I just, you know, that whole part of the show was, was all know. There was somebody else. There was a Chinese who... wall between the two, like editorial and advertising in, in a magazine and very little, except we will go over there to, and browse for free books and CDs sometimes. Or try to get books. Occasionally you would, you would, occasionally you would, occasionally you would, I remember you'd pre-interview somebody. You know, and you, you just start off saying like, you know, hello, sir. You know, so glad you're you're going to, uh, you know, be doing the show and, and and all that. And I always thought, okay, Jerry's like a a charming hostess at a restaurant. You know, it's <laughs> it's good that that's the the the, the first encounter you have uh, with the show. Yeah. But and I'd, I'd go off and go write something with Kevin Curran or something. You know, it's because uh, but, yeah, well, but the pre there were two kinds of pre interviews. One was. When you found out somebody who'd never done the show before, what they wanted to talk about. There were some people who didn't do that. Dave just knew him enough, like, oh, you know, Dreesen or somebody. Like Dreesen or Altman or whatever, yeah. Yeah, Altman. He'd talk about whatever he wants when he comes on because, you know, he's money in the bank. Uh, the other one was to see if someone was going to be a good guest. And that was very tricky. And I, I, I guess I, t I might have told the story before where the producers, I think it was Barry Sands, said, Wilfred Brimley wants to do the show. Uh, I said, okay. So we do pre-interview. I said, okay. Did I tell this story before? Yeah, you did. Anyway, keep it going. So um, I called. Hate to tell you, Jerry, but uh, I called. I called Wolf. You're repeating it. His hotel. You know, I was just I was one uh, Mr. Brimley, yes, uh, Jerry Morgan. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Yes, you had one day the show. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering, what would you, uh, what would you like to talk about? He goes, how the hell do I know? <laughs> you know what you want to talk about next Thursday afternoon at five thirty? Uh, no, uh, 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 no, but you know, I said, "Oh, I'm sorry." So it's fun. I hung up. It turned out he thought he was booked, and I was supposed to be calling him to make hotel reservations and flight flight arrangements and stuff. So it was a total miscommunication, and it was just he never got booked on the show because then Morty, uh, say, I guess Barry said to Morty, "So Morty, you want a pre-interview?" I'm not going to pre-interview. Sounds like a jerk. I have, I have a. Um... A reference to him uh, the last week of late night, uh, where the show played a tape of uh, it was the John and Lisa Liza show, uh, hmm. where with Wilfred Brimley singing. <laughs> wow, I'm glad we didn't book him now. Yeah. <laughs> a memorable one of uh, trying to find out who will and won't be a, a good guest. Do you remember the Purple Lady, Jerry? Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. It was. It was. We used to give this example uh, uh, when we did the the college lecture tour. It was a lady. She's the purple lady. Everything in her life is purple. Okay, <laughs> so, sounds sounds like a eccentric, colorful character. And I do remember. And she came on, you know, late segment on the show. So uh, you know, purple. Everything you have is purple. <laughs> wow. And her answer was, "It's my favorite color." <laughs> so, so all your clothes, purple. Your health. <laughs> Purple. Gene, uh, Gene Rath. Uh, <laughs> and it was just, and it's like, uh-oh. You realize inside of a minute, there's really nothing more to say. Yeah, case, uh, case closed. Well done. Yeah, the, the, the purple lady was always uh, the, the iconic example to me. Of, you never know. I think, you know, I, I, think I, I've, I, I find Robert De Niro like that. That he's a, I remember Jimmy Fallon was billboarding when he first came on the air. Like, Next week, our very first guest, Robert De Niro, and he's just, he's an actor. He, yeah. he becomes other people, but uh, he, as himself, he's just very monosyllabic, and, you know. His most memorable ad-lib is F. Trump, right? So, yeah. <laughs> that's right. By the way, one of the worst pitches I ever heard, one of the, of the talent department said, real seriously, uh, John Hallowell from Super Tramp wants to do the show. I said, okay, uh, well, is he interesting, or what he goes, well, he's very interesting. 
Oh, give me an example. He lives in LA and he rides a bike. <laughs> I said, uh, we got a sound effect. Yeah. That's not enough. Sorry. But Jerry, you told that story too, uh, your first uh, appearance on the oh, podcast. He appeared on the out. show. But the good news is the details were totally different. So <laughs> <laughs> Probably. that's the thing about memory, of course. He was he was the first sit in guest on the show on late night, John Hallowell. He sat in with the band? He sat in with the band and, and did oh. a did his own number and uh and, and had be, one segment talking at panel. He did have a segment talking. Well, yeah. at least we put got him in the band. That happened a lot of times where somebody would not <clears throat> not be a good sit down guest at panel, but you want him sitting in the band. Yeah. But he yeah. he was the first and, and then uh, uh David Sanborn uh, the year later when Chaka Khan was on and he was backing her up and then he stayed for the rest of the show and that began the Dave Sanborn tradition of having Oh, David Sanborn. You know, I have, <clears throat> I have a couple of things about that about that fact. One, I was a segment producer for Chaka Khan when she was doing it. We did a 90-minute show on yeah, Friday. That was it. Wow. That, that was Chaka Khan. I remember she she did her first number and I was out in the hallway at, at 6A and I see her getting up and and she's leaving the dressing room with her coat on leaving. And I said, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, excuse me, Miss Khan, uh, you know you're doing two numbers tonight, right? She says, oh yeah, I know. I just got to go to my apartment and get my gown. I have to get my, my second outfit. I said, well, you got to, but I was speechless and she made it. She she lived on, she lived very close and she just went, grabbed the thing and came back and she was on the show. She only did one song though. Maybe she got bumped. That would be the irony of irony. Of well, irony. That, that was the show with uh, Chaka Khan, Madeline Khan, and and uh, and Steve Khan playing in the band. <laughs> Steve Khan played a lot. Yeah. His and father, you know, Sam, and your his father, Sammy Khan. The, 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 right. Right, yeah. right. The famous uh, yeah, Sinatra songwriter. Yeah. Right. yeah. Jerry, on your first appearance, uh, you, you talked about how exciting it was for you to meet Bob Dylan. Who is oh, your God, yeah. number one music? And I say that to keep you from telling the story again, but also thank you. <laughs> thank you, you think you. of something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kid. Uh, just well, pe people, we're doing such granular details yeah. about uh, the show, but 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 it, that somebody could ask, who cares about this tiny stuff? But of course, if you're obsessively interested in this stuff, absolutely. You, you know, I mean, the the reason the the Peter Jackson Beatles documentary. Where, yep. you know, it's very tone deaf to say, what? Who wants to watch them uh, rehearse for six hours? I know. So, you know, don't watch, I watch, I watch every minute of it. I know. Yeah, it, well, you can't possibly have enough. And just thinking about you and Dylan, I remember uh, reading uh, Walter Isaacson's Steve Jobs biography. Uh -huh. He, uh, he uh, was an obsessive Dylan fan who listened to bootleg Dylan concert recordings. Wow. He owned well over a hundred of them. And just interesting that such a, a brilliant, wealthy guy, how would he choose to spend his, his free time? There's just something about Dylan, Dylan to me. I, uh, well, I mean, he's a genius, a writer. If, if you're song. into it, if, if, if it hits you, and the Beatles always hit me that way. And, you know, yes. baseball hits both of us that way. You know, we, Jeff, yeah. I, I, I meant to ask you, Jeff, uh, did you ever, I, I sent you those MOG files? Beatles mod files. Were you, were you ever able to access them? Open them up. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, good. All right. All right. I spent a good deal of time listening to you know okay. take twenty two of for no one. Sorry. <laughs> well. and so forth. Yeah, I did. Okay, I, good. I, right. I can't get Sorry. It off of it. Sorry for the tangent. Off that's tangent. exactly no no no. But that's the see. I'm the same way, just with different bands. Like I have so many bootleg copies of some of my favorite bands because hearing the variations of the different songs especially some of the bridges if they would do uh you know creative things for each show on tour you know maybe they they would play a different cover or something like that just to mix things up for them is endlessly fascinating yeah. i've i've very uh, many times made the comparison about letterman enthusiasts and music enthusiasts and how they're very similar in that regard um we had jason zinneman who wrote uh, letterman the last uh, giant of late yeah. night on last week and we talked about that and and, and I, no offense to the other uh you know hosts out there but letterman fans and fans of your production 
are a different breed. And I think it, it they attract for whatever reason, there's some vibrational frequency that attracts that similar personality, the personality that does want to live, listen to the different takes of a, of a song or, or, or whatnot. And, and these stories that you're talking about from the show are endlessly fascinating. They just, they just are. You know, um, Jason Zinneman was in, Jason Zinneman was in my house. Did every did he uh did he take anything? <laughs> name <laughs> name dropping. Well, he's the book, and I had just had my knee replaced and I wasn't moving around much. And he came out from Manhattan or Brooklyn, I don't remember, but he, he didn't drive. So he had to take New Jersey transit. <laughs> you know, figuring out the timetables, working your way through Port Authority, what gate and all this stuff, and how, what zone are you going to, all that stuff. And uh he finally made it and he calls and says, I'm outside a gas station and it looks like it's maybe route three or something. They dropped me off here because I told them I want to go to Nutley. So my wife, my wife went out and picked him up and brought him out. And he was uh, very congenial. That's, That's awesome. A great story. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of Zinneman being stranded at a gas station in New Jersey going after the story. That's uh that's, that's fun. That's um, war, car, war correspondent. Sure. I want to go back for just just for a second. Um, uh, the purple lady, uh, Jean Rath. I, I put together a, a, a compilation of eccentric civilian guests on the show, and and she's one of them. Uh, was the nut? Com- was the nut lady there? Uh, the nut lady was Early. Elizabeth Tast- Tast- Tastian, the, the 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 nut museum. Yes, you know Chris Elliott lives in her house. I bought her <laughs> house that was the nut museum. I take it she, in Old she's Old Connecticut, and he lives in the he lives in what was formerly the Nut Museum. I take it she's no longer among the living. I mean, I don't know. Well, you know, wow. she was like ninety when she was on the show. Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, Ruth Norman, the cosmic visionary. I remember oh, that? I remember her. Uh, Tom yeah, Hughes, was... Tom Hughes, the Potato Museum. <laughs> <laughs> they sound like they sound like fake stuff that we would do in a big big production. Piece. And then there's an old guy named uh, uh, Lowell Davis, and he kept names. He and Dave introduced him to everybody in the studio, and at the end he recited all the um, names. He was like in his late eighties. Uh, a food collector, George Mustalier, uh, uh, Isla Lot- Locher, the Turtle Lady. Don't I remember. Her. I, rem- I, I remember uh, Kathleen Anchors, uh, the the uh, the yeah. designer on the show, uh, played uh, the. She's the caretaker of Cranberryville. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, what, it, what it was was just cylinders of, of cranberry. Oh, cran- and they, well, it, 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 was, it was it was a funny bit where but they were they weren't know, sculpt they weren't sculpted into anything resembling any. It was just it was just a cranberry in, in quotes. The bit it, it was it was a very cute bit where he. Uh, you know, Dave asked Kathleen, you know, so what is Cranberryville? And she says, well, you won't find it on any map. You know, <laughs> of course, you can picture <laughs> Kathleen. But she was a library. That. She was a library lady. Yeah, in her yes. British accent. But the, 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 some of the people in Cranberryville, it was again, just cylinders of cranberries, but <laughs> one, one was, had a little motorcycle next to it. And that was <laughs> Evil Knievel. <laughs> <laughs> Had a little whipped cream, white whipped cream on top of it. <laughs> that was Lauren Green. I'm, I'm getting the screen catcher. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. So that that was that was Kathleen Anchor's uh, version of uh, the so uh, real life eccentrics. We'll get back to that and Kathleen and the screen capture in a second, but I just want to do a quick shout out because at the end of the day, YouTube didn't exist back then. There was no internet. There was no anything. Finding these characters. Uh, let's do a shout out real quick to Madeline Smithberg right now because we know her and love her. And and yeah. I mean, but, you talk about somebody who... There she is. Hello, Madeline. <laughs> Mulligan over here. <laughs> I follow you on Facebook. There we go. Somebody who actually like had a real knack and talent for finding some of these just odd, odd stories and hobbies and people and all of that. Madeline, uh, just really, really, uh, key to that. We hope to have her on the show here, um, as well, but, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the, these are people now who appear on YouTube and, and every once in a while they'll go, you know, viral or whatever, but you think about some of these odd characters, like remember, uh, remember the Carson, the, the big famous one was the Carson, uh, the gal who would come on Carson and she had potato chips that were shaped like 
other she things was, or people. She was on Dave first, and then she appeared on John. Okay, was she really? I thought I see. There we go. Thank you, Don. I didn't know that she was on Dave first. Yeah, they were very. You know, those, obviously Dave worshipped worshipped Carson, yeah. and when he wanted to do the uh, that Thursday night bit, what was it? Anyway, he would do Karnak. He would have Paul. Paul would do Karnak. Yep. He made a point, obviously, of calling Johnny and asking, and uh, yeah. of course, Johnny did. That was, and, I had to write stuff. I, I was one of the people writing stuff for the, the Karnak jokes, too, which is a, a very limited, <laughs> you got a little narrow range here, but yeah. I see that to me that 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 stuff there is just I'm endlessly fascinated with that like like I, I use this example all the time um the uh, Don's compilation of talk show hosts that have appeared uh on on Letterman and it's like seven parts and each part is like 90 minutes and and the yeah. legacies of these things um you know early on like Jeff when you were there um did the idea of trying to stay away from the stuff that Carson was doing yet every once in a while there'd be like sort of a a tribute that kind of a thing like was that ever something that was ever discussed or or did it just kind of unfold and now again we're looking at it gee the through, shows had such different sensibilities you yeah know, dave wasn't about to be aunt blabby no <laughs> <laughs> a bit where carson would would don an old lady uh, dress and wig so uh i you know uh the only memory that triggers is somebody had one halloween had made an genius pumpkin where you turned a crank and it made the 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 pumpkin eyes and mouth go in and out and uh he'd send it in and dave dave like hey that's pretty nifty and he actually showed it on the show and the guy had also i think sent it to uh, live at five or cars it, it it appeared on several shows that night simultaneously that's that's the only thing along those lines i can remember you know what i remember along those lines we had i think it was matt leblanc a guest and remember this? He was in the first segment, and he had to rush out because he was doing Conan also. <laughs> so he raced over from CBS. Oh my God! Is this, is this Madeline Smithberg? No, that's Kathleen. Oh, that's Kathleen. Oh, that's Kathleen. Kathleen. Oh, it's me. It's the leading citizen of Cranberryville. <laughs> hey, I remembered it right. There's Lauren Green. Oh the my left. God! I'm and there's Evil Can Evil on the right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was such a respected scenic designer. Hello. Oh, and there's uh, there you go. his daughter, the brown. Matthew was, Matthew was pretty thrilled. Uh, <laughs> I remember I was in the elevator with Kathleen Anchors one time, and I said, you know, I was reading in the, and she was a scenic designer. I was reading in the Times about the the uh, an inspector calls an old British play it opened on Broadway, got really good reviews, and they particularly liked the uh, the the sets and all. She says, you know, I designed that, darling, in London. And she did. She des she designed some oh. some big shows in London. And then she was doing the live the foul mouth library lady on uh, late night television. I, I was I was go gonna, ahead, Don. I was going to look for. Uh, I have some uncensored uh, uh, Kathleen. Oh but, really? But I can't really. It, <laughs> it's not going to. I can't do it here. So forget it. Okay. I, I want to ask the two of you uh, <laughs> about the 1988 strike. And how right. it may or may not have affected your relationship with Dave or the show when you returned. Uh, it, to me, my 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 older daughter uh, was born during that strike, mm -hmm. so it, it it was it was gloriously well timed for me. Oh. Yeah, I spent a lot more time with my. Also, we were getting residuals. It's not like we were not getting paid. We were they were running reruns a lot of the time. We were getting residuals for that. And I don't, I don't think anybody resented it. I did. I, 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 I was a member. I'm a member of two unions. I'm sure Jeff is too. And that's what you do. You know, we, he we, was with, with the residual payment would add up to about half your salary. Yeah, half your salary to not work when you have yeah. a brand new baby. So we, I, I had this glorious idyllic time where Absolutely. my wife and I. We'd sleep when Samantha slept. We'd, we'd uh, you know, yeah, and, and my wife, that's... my wife cried when I, I went back. I know that stuff is just, it's just priceless. It really is. Pri I felt that way when I finally retired, I got to, or I finally started taking Fridays off. I got a new contract. I didn't have to spend Friday because we taped it the night before. I went to my daughter's per Halloween parade for the first time. She was like seven years old. It was adorable. 
-hmm. All these kids in costumes walking around the schoolyard. It was adorable. Jerry, on your Letterman Channel thing, when the brownie bit, when uh, Letterman uh, asked your daughter, uh, "So, does does your dad talk about me a lot?" And she did a made a very funny dubious face. <laughs> she did this. Yes. Was that coached or did she just do that? Oh, she just did that. No, there was no coaching. Yeah. She's very hard to coach. By the way, she's a very successful painter these days. She's in. Uh, she's done shows in uh, all over the all over the, all over the <laughs> Europe and the U.S. and stuff, and Wellington, New Zealand. She had, she was recently in a group show. Very successful. And you're talking about uh, art that goes on walls rather than painting the walls. She hasn't. You know, she's not a very successful house painter. She's no. Uh, what kind of stuff did, did she do? <clears throat> she did paint. She somehow used to paint on her walls when she was a little kid and paint on the. We were, she had stuff on the ceiling and she refused to tell us how she got it there. But anyway, no. we're guessing there were no ladders. It was a mysterious thing. But anyway, that's all she wanted to do. She went to art school, got her MFA, and uh, paint. That's all she ever wanted to do. What yeah, no, my daughter, my daughter Samantha, by the way, was also on the show when she was a baby and uh, was also upset, like like your son. Kevin. It's freezing. Freezing. Yeah. Well, it was it was a bit with Mary Connolly, where who was always pregnant, yeah, that, that that bit. It, uh, it looked like, oh, your baby's finally born. No, she's still pregnant. This is her niece. Uh, <laughs> and Samantha looked around and got cold and, and cried. Oh, there. my God. It was Catherine, one of her paintings of when she was in art school. Isn't that something? Sweet. Very sweet. Yeah, she's a, she, I love her. And, uh, and, but the, the, a bit on the show that night was that Jerry Vale was like the greeter in the green room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so going into commercial... You had Jerry Vale going, don't cry, sweetheart, don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, to Samantha, which was very dear. And, okay, if we're bragging on daughters, Jerry, yeah. he, he, she's now a, a, a big deal uh, writer at Nickelodeon. There you go. Written for, I was gonna. Uh, I was gonna say that both of you have uh, uh, daughters who have gotten into the creative space, the artistic space. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Jerry, an artist yeah. there, and, and and Jeff, writer at The Simpsons and other things as well. Both your daughters yeah, have written the Simpsons. Simpsons episodes with both my daughters, and uh, also my my younger daughter Jenna. Uh, she's writing for. The, she's on the writing staff of the latest Frasier reboot, which is going to be on Paramount Plus. And uh, yeah, I have Paramount Plus. Yeah. The, the, oh, the, I, I, I got nothing to plug for myself, but I'll. <laughs> the the Jerry Vale greeter that was a full week and that was that was shortly after the strike had ended, um, and and I want to go back to that if I can. Sure. Did 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 your relationship did the dynamics change with with between you between the writers and Dave after you all returned? Because Dave went on and did shows. You're saying. Oh yeah, I mean, it, no, not that I recall. Actually, I remember Dave asked us to come in, and and ex told us I'm going to to do some shows without writers, yeah. and I just wanted you guys to know and all that. And I thought that was decent of him, and yeah. I I didn't object at all to him doing it. I I, I objected to the the uh, the residual checks uh, drying up, but. Uh, yeah. I didn't oh, blame right. him. Yeah. Really once he went back on, that's why there was no checks. Yeah, but the money know, was, the money started running out after that. So, yeah. Yeah. so, I, so think, no... I also think you want to keep the, the brand going, so to speak. Because yeah. the morning show, uh, maybe it was uh, early days of late night, we had a three-week block off in the summer. And they would never do that again, just because it was the rating, it really suffered. The ratings really suffered because it was pretty early into the run. So to get three weeks worth of, re re of re you know reruns, not a big bank to draw from. So there's a lot of stuff that's been on like a month before and stuff like that. And also people just got tired. They just want to see Dave. They want to see Dave whining about the Connecticut State Troopers on the Merritt Parkway and stuff. You know, they really they love that kind of. They really do love that stuff. They really do. But especially but, if he's kind of if he's kind of opaque about it. You know, he just say like, just want to shout out to the Connecticut State Police. Keep it up, boys. You're doing a great job. Keeping the keeping the Merritt Parkway safe. Thank you, sir. That kind of stuff. I think that there's a reset that happens. Um, I can I can certainly speak to it for uh, the last writer's strike where everybody grew beards and all of that stuff. Um, you know, I, I think about Conan and how his show changed considerably during that strike, where he would go out there and literal the time killers. You know, and again, that's a that's a shout out to. Uh, you know, Hal Gurney's, uh, of course, before that, but, or Hal Gertner, 
um, you know, flipping a coin around and seeing how, how, how long the coin would spin for and things like that, the way that they would kill time. I think it would take the host and give them sort of a reset when that would happen. Um, you guys have been involved, I guess, you know, writers forever. How many strikes did you guys go through in your tenures of, at your respective shows? I went, I went through uh, 1980. I remember 1980, our show was about to be, the morning show was about to be canceled. There was a writer's guild strike. And I was picketing. I was assigned outside the, uh, well, it's Trump Tower now, but it used to be the headquarters of some big studio. I can't remember which one it was. And I remember I was walking with uh, the two, the co-writers of Superman that had just debuted that day or the week before or whatever. It was a smash. It was a huge hit. And I was on a failing. So the three of us were like 1930s <laughs> radicals. Here we go. Bring down the man. Bring down the man. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're just counting their money. The money is just falling from the ceiling like Scrooge McDuck. They're just floating around in it. Anyway, I was counting on my unemployment checks, which, okay, I lived on unemployment checks for like six months. You know, I uh, Don, my, my initial answer was, no, it didn't change uh, uh, our relationship with Dave. I wonder if, you know, Dave, Dave, while we were there, was pushing more and more toward real stuff, less inclined to do, to do you know, sketches and conceits and, yeah. and, and theme shows. And uh, probably that was just his disposition. But I wonder if, if doing those shows uh, naked, if you will, you yeah, know, hastens okay. that movement. We used to have a lot of theme night. We had a Harmon Killebrew night, if you remember. That's because he was, put, he his, was bumped, put his jersey up in the rafters and stuff. And, because he uh, was bumped from the, well, uh, from I, the first film festival. That's why they gave him the full show. Oh, I'm pretty right? certain I told yeah. this. I'm pretty certain I told. Wow. Yeah, he was going to be in the first film festival, and he got bumped. So we did a whole part of Killebrew night, yeah. and and used the uh, the film that I think Kevin Kern and Fred Graver shot out in Payette, Idaho. But I, I got to I got to go sit in the booth uh, for a Yankees Twins game with Herman. Oh, yeah. Got with him afterwards. The the nicest man imaginable. And, yeah, I think he's one of those guys who played in a small market team. If he played in New York or L.A., it would have been a household word. And he just was. I mean, baseball fans knew how great he was, but he was not a house. He wasn't, you know, Derek Jeter or Aaron Judge. No, I I, I told uh, I told uh, during my epic three hour uh, first two part uh, appearance on this podcast <laughs> last month. <laughs> <laughs> I I told this story, Jerry. But do you remember on the Harmon Killebrew night? Uh, uh, Dave did a, a this is your life kind of thing with Harmon where he said now Harmon do you rem recognize this voice and it was Liberace backstage <laughs> going like Harmon <laughs> you know the year you won the most valuable player I opened a residency <laughs> in the casino you know and just do you know who that is <laughs> Harmon I have no idea <laughs> really funny. and Liberace came out and then and it was Harmon Killebrew Liberace and Dave and the nice thing was, it worked because they were just both nice gentlemen, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. People without attitude are always easier to deal with. The more like the, the audience relates to them much more. Yeah, but On just the other hand, we had Madonna who came out, gave Dave a pair of her panties, smoked a big cigar, made a lot of double entendres about it. You know, no, we, come on, Madonna, come on, we don't need you. <clears throat> I now she's I'm apparently in witness protection because I saw her on the Grammys, and she was totally unrecognizable. Yeah, she yeah, has I, taken an interesting turn of late. There's no question sad. about that. It's just sad. I mean, you know, she's she just shouldn't. Whatever. Jeff, I'm 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 looking for the uh, I'm looking for your daughter in the. Uh, uh, that would be fun. But I I the uh, uh, what's his face? I can't think of uh, Jerry Vale. The, the Jerry Vale was greeter, and 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 I haven't found it yet. He was on for the full week, but so far I'm I'm striking out. I'll uh, at least within the one segment that he did. After the opening, well, what, what, what was Mary Connolly, the pregnant lady? Was she Connie? Oh, Connie, Connie Plesco. Connie Plesco. That's Connie it. Plesco. Wow. <laughs> All right. If there's a Connie Plesco segment. Uh, the, the oh, okay. The week that uh, that that's 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 where Samantha appeared. But like yeah, not, your daughter's into painting. Jerry Samantha's a, a comedy writer and songwriter. But not the Jerry Vale right. reader thing. Hmm. But it. Was Connie Plesko and Jerry Vale on the same? Do, yeah, do, yeah. Do, it was okay. Connie Plesko was on while Jerry Vale was uh, the greeter in the green room. Gotcha. 
Who writes the name Connie Plesko? Like, how does that? Where do the names come up with for 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 character names like that? Like, I know that Steve O'Donnell. Wow. That's O'Donnell. Yes, that's Steve. Connie Plesko. Okay, here we go. All right, um, we're in the ballpark. Okay, like the names you would come up with for the different characters who would come out on stage. Like, is it just it's an automatopoeia thing? Like, okay, yeah, this just has a nice little ring to it, or like, are they all inside jokes? How do how do names? Well, they can't be too. Come? They can't be too silly, you know. They can't be modern yeah. or nerd buster or something, you know. They're just you don't want really silly. They should be a little bit. I I remember one example. Larry Larry David Larry Jacobson and I were in the audience. We were a couple, apparently. I don't remember the details at all. But we were trying to come up with a name for my, my partner, so and so. And David just said Lewis. And for some reason, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Lewis just was just the perfect name there. It couldn't be silly. Yeah. You know, it just had to be Lewis. And it's just like, oh, okay. And, you know, he's not Lou, it's Lewis and whatever. I would usually just name, name check friends or relatives. Just, you know. Get... Yeah, there were a few. There were a few of those. Yeah. 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 Lots of little shout outs and inside jokes, that kind of a thing. A few of those, a few of those. But again, sometimes you're so wrapped up in it and you just, you know, just uh, got to get this out. Oh, deadline, deadline, deadline. There are deadlines all the time. Just deadlines yeah. all the time. Yeah, and, and that's, that's when everything is carefully thought through. That's that's for sure. There's some, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I know, sometimes. But wait a minute. How are we going to? And also the thing, I, used, I, I, I was a, came from literary background. I was a teacher of English and I wrote short stories and poems and stuff. And you just realize that you can't just write something. It has to be producible. You know, and right. either that or it's going to be it's going to take millions of dollars to actually fly a helicopter over the audience or something. You know, and there, there are safety concerns. We have the right. John has a picture Whatever. of baby Samantha here. There you oh. go. Oh. That, no? oh. and that's Connie. <laughs> Connie Plesko. <laughs> oh, Samantha, baby. Oh, she's freezing. She's probably freezing. <laughs> Although she, she, she had more up. clothes on than Kevin when. Uh, Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, that's adorable. Knowing Kevin, anything for his craft. No. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's in <laughs> Chicago now, writing a, a writing on his novel. He got his MFA in writing. He's just not successful with the first one. Working on a second one, published in small magazines. There's not a lot of money in small magazines, as I found out early on. So <laughs> it's very hard to get a literary literary thing published and successful. Right. You know, very very few. So he's working as a man. He's managing a coffee shop in Chicago now, where he followed his girlfriend, who's an, an artist at uh, teaching at uh, the Art Institute of the Chicago Museum of Art. But anyway, that's where we are. And Don has another. <laughs> oh, oh, hello. oh, okay. Wow. There's me and Oprah together. We were an item very briefly. <laughs> <clears throat> very briefly. As you well know, it was Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine. That was so Mad. Mad. Is that Mad. artist Angelo Torres? I think so. Well, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Forget, that was like I was so. I love well, Mad all Magazine. Those, all those lesser, more druckers. Yeah. Yeah, more druckers. <laughs> lesser, more druckers. That's very accurate. The the amazing thing is how many people read Mad Magazine religiously. It came when it came out every month. I remember buying it. And the newsstand, I'm mean, taking the bus back from high school to, to home. I remember one very distinctly, for some reason, where this kid is on the back. On the back of the magazine was a fake ad for cr crust toothpaste. And it said, look, Ma, no cavities. And the kid just had like all these missing teeth. For some <laughs> reason, that really that really stuck with me. I was like 12 years old. But at any rate, Mad Magazine, that and... Uh, well, just for people our age, I think that that was just such a signifier of, oh, huge. you can be silly when you're an adult. You yeah, know? absolutely. Absolutely. And then then at CBS, we were across we were across from Broadway DC from the offices of Mad Magazine for a while. Yeah. And we could just sometimes they put up a couple of things indicating they'd watch the show uh, the night before. I don't remember what they were exactly. But I, I also uh... remember... I've got a couple of friends who are DC former DC artists who worked at that building and and, and whatnot and 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 of course Shecky, 
uh i've i've made him tell me so many stories because i mean he he goes deep into the comic book stuff and and he made oh, yeah. good friends with some of the people across the street um and it, it's funny to, you talking about mad magazine and adults acting silly that's exactly so again me as your younger audience watching what you guys did it was exactly that the permission for adults to be silly i remember being like nine or ten years old uh, there was a there was a certain segment that I remember watching at a friend's sleepover where stacks of dishes like chinaware were stacked up throughout uh, the stage, and someone gave Dave a remote control car, and it was just chaos as the remote control car would go and break the the all the the the, the wow. fine bone china as it was built or something <coughs> like that. It would break all these dishes, and as a kid seeing that. Um, that's exactly it. Now you talk about Mad Magazine. Um, in the in, uh, Jeff, I think this is probably after your time at The Simpsons. Um, but it was around season ten where The Simpsons went to New York, and and Bart went and saw the yeah, header of the episode, building for Mad yeah. Magazine. He's like Mad Magazine, and this what happened in that is exactly how I used to imagine your offices being like. Bart went up the elevator. The elevator door opens. And it's just for a second, and there's chaos happening, like just chaos happening. And Alfred E. Newman pokes his head out or whatever, and then it closes, and that's that's basically it. That is how I used to imagine your offices. I used to imagine it like that, like they're just being chaos there as a fan uh, growing up, and 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 more more like that than most, I'd say, simply because most most of the writers anyway were in our twenties. Yeah, and, uh, most. Mo well, <laughs> not all. No, no. Jerry, Jerry was Jerry was older. Jerry was around 40, though. I will say, Jerry, occasionally a magazine I remember would do uh, a piece on the Letterman writers and they always would say, like, you know, Jerry Mulligan's older. But, you know, the effervescent Mulligan is clearly in his prime and things like that. <laughs> Watch out. That's, that's how Don Lemon got in trouble. So be careful. <laughs> Effervescent shout out, uh, shout out for the three dollar Harvard word there. Um, I uh, I, I, that's actually a question that I do have for you guys. Um, favorite vocabulary are there are there words that you have that are go to words where they're just um, you know, a turn turns of phrase or or things that 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 you still kind of go back to and they're very much you know, letterman words. Oh, I, I don't know if this is a letterman thing, I don't have any words from the show like that. There's a phrase that I always find entertaining when I come across it. And it's, and some will say, uh, so Madonna has just bought a, a twin pair of leopards and she's, in, you know, as one does. And I just think the phrase as one does in that sort of yep. context is just hysterical, you know, or so-and-so is having a, an extra leg put on beyond the middle of her back as, as one does. And <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Anyway. I love that too. And another Jeff? one. Oh. oh, Jerry would just say things like, you know, I, Letterman liked phrases like scuff resistant, you know. Just, <laughs> now that's me. Here's all right, way, Jerry. Henry VIII playing tennis. Is that yeah, what you know what that about? is? This is on one of the gems of 30 Rock that very few people know about. There's this beautiful garden up on the uh, 12th mm -hmm. floor. And I had a window I could almost crawl out into it. And you're right across from St. Patrick's Cathedral. I know 30 Rock did a, the, the show did a, a wedding up there. But it's grass. It's just beautiful. And it's just, I've never seen it featured anywhere. Or maybe in books about Rockefeller Center, but it's not a big, it's not a tourist attraction because it's not for the tourists. It's, a, it's the West Wing. It's just uh, NBC. They, they, shot was... a, they shot a, a, a party there on the series Uncoupled that my wife Suzanne is going to be writing. Is that right? Yeah, the second season. It's beautiful. And it, it, just, it is. Yeah, it's it looked beautiful. And just to finish up, uh, you know my daughter Jenna Jerry. She's uh, she's sure. on the writing staff of the latest Frasier reboot. Right. That's going to be on Paramount Plus. So that's right. They're yeah. they're all uh, they're all keeping busy on writing staffs. And Chris Harris is on that writing staff. I keep as busy well, doing podcasts about uh, <laughs> <laughs> shows Who from else? the previous century. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who else, Mike? Did you say something? Uh, else? Chris Harris is on there as well. Oh, is he really? Yeah. Good. Is on the uh, the Frasier? the Frasier writing staff. I'll I'll ask my daughter about him. All yeah. right. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna come on our show, but he wanted to wait until um that block because they're working. I, I think they're probably at the tail end of it now on that on that side of things, but they're 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 busting it on that show. Last I talked to him and 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 well, yeah. Who's coming back? Is is everybody well John Maloney died, right? I know that. I, I don't think anyone's coming back. I think oh, uh, is that right? Totally I think like Frazier's son. You know, he moves back to Boston and, and it's uh oh I think he's uh getting to know his know. son. Okay. 
Fair enough. Yeah. Kelsey Grammer, money in the bank. <laughs> yeah. They liked it twice and they'll love it three times. You, you love it. <laughs> three times as much. Sure. The show is, yes. all right? I was just going through cheers, uh, actually. You know what they like and give it to them good and hard. Yeah. <laughs> that that uh, Elizabethan costume was part of travel brochures uh, from April of 93. So it was the, what the was last, I, last... Why was it... What were the, what were the travelers going to come to see? Did they say? <laughs> yeah, we didn't really tease out all the implications of all, everything we did on the show. It wasn't all that thought out. Yeah, we never did that. I'm By not the sure way, the word was ever said on the show. Eye, oh, right. It's a challenge us. for the folks listening at home, what, what Don mm -hmm. means by that. or what. Also, <laughs> Dave did a couple of bits in the in that garden, and uh, I think Spike Ferriston did, uh, showed Dave how he could he could uh, uh, do a fish line like into, a cast? into one of the into 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 the warders there uh, from his from his office window. <laughs> Wow. Really? Yeah. Um, I ran into Spike Fairston. We got our hair cut at the same place uh like five days ago. Oh, that's no obvious. Kidding. You can see. Isn't that something? He's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm only a nodding acquaintance. He was after my time, but we we know each other. And uh he was uh what are you doing? He's making a movie with Jerry Seinfeld. So. Yeah. yeah. Spike he loves really the cars. Good. He's doing a lot of stuff. He has a show about cars, I know. Yep. Mm -hmm. Luxury yeah, cars yeah, podcast, yeah. He's, he's deeply into cars. He knows a yeah. lot about cars. Yeah. And his son, his brother, his brother is the Wally is a main two car guy in SNL. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you see him and you see him all the time going to burning back and forth before the setups and stuff. I uh, Spike's the guy that fact. Spike is definitely a guy we want to get on the show. Um, and this actually leads to um Two perspectives here, because we've got Jerry, who was there, like all the way back to, you know, writing monologue jokes for 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 Dave on Carson, all the way to, you know, for for the end. At the end of the day, obviously things changed at the end, but you were there. You saw all these runs, mm -hmm. um, and then you know, Jason does a good job talking about this in 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 his book. But the phases of late night, you know, the early phase, and then and then. Uh, you know, with the original writers and then when, when, when Downey, Downey took over and then after he left and then the influx happens, uh, stays that same for a while. And then there's another turnover, Jerry, you saw the turnovers, Jeff, you were part of the, of the turnover, uh, of probably the second or third, um, iteration of, of, of that staff. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about the points of view of both of you guys, because Jerry, you were there the whole time and there weren't a lot of war horses who were there the whole time. Um, sure. And then, you know, Jeff moving on with, with others to the Simpsons and things like that. Jerry, was that ever something that, uh, that ever tempted you uh, to, to, to make these moves that some of these other contemporaries a, were making? <clears throat> I had a couple of offers to go to, to California. Uh, one for a very successful show, news radio. Oh, and the other one so for a, wanted to grab a show that didn't happen. Because Paul Sims, I knew from the show. Yeah. And he promised that I would be out of the parking lot at the studio at 5 p.m. every day, which was very appealing to me. But, you know, my family was here and I was I was set up. The other one was for a show. Well, it never happened. Somebody somebody who was a writer on our show, was a head writer for a while, uh, went to a, a senior citizen's home in Florida. In, for real. And lived there for like a couple of months and wrote a book about it. You know who I'm talking about, Jeff? Rodney. Rodney Rothman. But anyway, he was trying to sell a pilot to NBC. And, I, and my agent, got the same agent, he, he, he called me and said, Rodney, why don't you work on this pilot? Uh, whatever. I said, eh, I don't, I'm not going to California. So anyway, that's what I was tempted. I lived in LA for like, I lived in LA for, I lived in San Francisco for seven years, which I like. I couldn't even afford to live there now. And I lived in LA for like three years. And uh, I like San Francisco better. I'm in these, I'm in these what do you got, then? What do you got? Oh, no, no. Oh. This, is, this, this is the bit as it airs. <laughs> oh, medieval tennis world. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Now it makes sense. What do you have? To, do you have this framed? No, no, no it's on no, an it's, iPad. I, I just took a, a oh, sure, screen capture from the iPad. iPad. Uh, yeah, it's from the iPad. Yeah. The the uh, the stat the um, the phase I was in it was really remarkably consistent considering I was there for six more than six years. Yeah, you know I just you could call it the Steve O'Donnell time. Yeah, but, but when when all those guys left for the new show it was basically uh, 
you know, the staff stayed, there was a little turnover, but it was really awfully consistent for the whole six years I was there. Yeah, so. there was some, there were some, some uh, things like the band was pretty steady. And yeah. Paul, and David really realized on, relied on that for his go-to stuff, Doug Paul talking back and forth with Paul, and he loves music. Yeah. And he loves to play the drums. Did anybody mention that David in rehearsal would play the drums insanely loud almost ever every time he went to rehearsal? When he went to rehearsal, didn't always go to rehearsal. You know, he would watch it on the feed in his office. And uh, anybody mentioned the time at NBC where uh, <laughs> David would throw a baseball around? He had gloves around. He would throw a baseball back and forth. He would chatting, whatever. And he threw, Bill Wendell was up there. I don't know if Bill Wendell threw the ball or he threw the ball to Bill Wendell. <clears throat> Went right through the window, smashed the glass, and out onto uh, Sixth Avenue from the 14th floor. And I was yep. like, okay, 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 let's hope nobody, and nobody did. <clears throat> and they fixed it like, Mr. Letterman needs a new window. <laughs> I board, feel like Dave talked board. about that one day and he talked you about didn't the see fear. And then he said, well, he sent an intern down to see if anybody was. <laughs> I think yeah, that was the... nobody was. Thank God. Uh, let's see. Jeff? No. Nope. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. That was my, uh, I think I'm out. Of course, I thought that uh, last month, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, Any other tidbits? Anything else we can clear up? Any of these mysteries of the show? That I'm, I might be. I there. just. Well, it's very good to see you, Jerry. Let me say it's great that. To, great to see you. Love you. you got anything else? It was a, a joy to, to share an office with you all those years ago. Oh, I loved it, man. I, the last time I saw Jeff was right before right before COVID. You were in the city, and we went to the TikTok Diner mm -hmm. in Clifton, New Jersey, who has a big neon sign with the phrase, eat heavy. And <laughs> whenever they would come and shoot stuff in the area, but they did not, they, all the crew and all would get their, get their food from TikTok. But that was the last time I saw Jeff. And, uh, you know. He's he's a three thousand miles away. I think about him constantly. <laughs> anyway, I want to before you before cry my name into your pillow. Here, do you? All right. <laughs> before we got to close it up here, like the idea of getting um, you know you guys together to talk about this stuff. I cannot tell mm -hmm. you. I know it may not to you seem endlessly fascinating. It is endlessly fascinating. I love this stuff. Even hearing your reporters going back and forth in the little tennis match here, that's of, of, of memories, you know, taking advantage of, of Zoom. I hope one day that we can figure something out where we can get a bunch of you together on panel for the long form stuff. I know Conan and his former uh, staffers are doing that a lot these days. There's a lot of very cool um, sure. venues to do that. I would love to get us all into one uh, place live together to do this kind of a thing. But thank you so, so much for giving of your time and, and of your memory banks for oh, us. No, this I'm is very, really appreciated, guys. Very flattering that somebody <clears throat> would uh, would even consider me worth talking to. Yeah, I, around, they, no, look, the these, this stuff is all very interesting. These memories are all very dear to me. I yeah. just, uh, you know, I, I would never charge money for, to uh, tell people about them or assume the, expert, the average just, person. The, the you were saying about the election tour, you know, if it was free, it would be overflowing if we had to charge. The expectation mm -hmm. level is infinitely higher. And I, I thrive on low expectations. Yeah, me too. It's 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 how we've gotten to where we are right now. Um, but at the end of the day, no, I, I those lecture tours. This is that's one of the reasons why I thought of you two. Like, there's a few people that I wanted to pair up. The lecture tour and and sharing the office was one of the reasons why I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that 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 juxtaposition of the guy who was there for you know six years versus you know decades, that kind of a thing. I just I just really really wanted to get you two together. I thank you so much. Is there anything else that we want to talk about before we wrap this one up? Not at all. I just nope. uh, I appreciate all the work you do. Once again, Don's keep up the good work. Yeah, I mean, I'm not done calling on you for correct. And feel free to correct anything I say in, on Twitter or Facebook or anything else. Um, I know you. I know you will. <laughs> I, I, I've said this too many times. It, it, it's a kick to to quote know you guys. Yep. Uh, I mean, I I I was in my 30s when late night was on. And just watching you folks, and now here I am, like talking with you guys is is uh, uh, I'm going to come across as a fan, so I'm not going to do that or fawning. Okay. No, no, it's, it's, no, it's, it's just, a very I, great. It's, it's, I think it's, your it's sneakers really, out, Don. It's, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really big honor for you, Don. I appreciate that. But, okay. <laughs> Anyways, that, I guess that wraps it. I think okay. that wraps it. Um, thanks, Jerry. Again, please guys. give my uh, best to your wife, would you? 
Oh, sure. You should. You do to the my ocean state uh, friend uh, Suzanne. Okay. All Samantha right. and Jenna. Anybody else do you think I would say that to? You okay. see Spike again, so I'm, oh, I don't care. <laughs> Thanks, hey, boys. guys. Appreciate you both very much. Talk okay. to you soon. Bye. Thanks so Take much, care. Mike. Anytime. Okay. One goes. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 I gotta go. Uh, leave. You can do it. You can do I it. I tried to leave. They won't let me. <laughs> there you go. Well, God. there we go. That was a bit of a cluster. It was great. A great cluster. You're still taping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want to disappear and do an outro, I was going to do the outro with you, but oh, God, there he goes, just like that. Um, I really, really appreciated uh, the time. <laughs> Not just the time of of uh, Jeff and Jerry. I appreciate their time very, very much and sharing some of these uh, moments with us. But of course, of Don as well. And and uh, the episode, uh, of course, changes course in a good way with Don here because he can he has access so quickly to these screen captures and things that 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 bring these memories. Uh, that was our maiden voyage of doing a mashup episode. Everybody, thank you so much for taking time to uh to listen or watch whatever it is uh another episode of the letterman podcast with mike chisholm coincidentally i am mike chisholm oh wait no wait hold on hello deli we have one sponsor at the letterman podcast and one sponsor only that is rupert g and the hello deli go to hello-deli.com uh to shop for late show with uh david letterman merchandise also hello deli merchandise we were talking about a couple of different new shirts that uh might be coming out rupert shirts and and, and things and um maybe you know for this last little stretch of however long the deli is going to be open for maybe we can have some new dave shirts uh beforehand as well so we're talking about some of these things in the background but uh go to hello-deli.com and shop for Late Show with David Letterman merchandise um, or Rupert G and the Hello Deli merchandise. He packs this stuff on his own. If uh, you ask really nicely, he might even add onions to your online order. So thank you very much. We're just having a great time host uh, producing the Letterman podcast. Um, thank you very much for all the early adopters. Join the Facebook group. Uh, like, share, subscribe, all of that crap. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants.